All right, let's see if we can do this tonight. I've just been having the, the worst time recording this, so hello. Uh, this is going to be the first part of my reading to you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the foundation, about Salem, and about my two main characters. And I'm going to try to make this quick. This, uh, well, I won't make it too quick, but you'll hear a lot of the talk of the foundation. The foundation is really a conglomeration that's formed over the centuries of what used to be known as gentlemen and adventurous clubs. Uh, it started forming back in the late uh, 1700s and continued on through the 1800s up until the early 1900s. Most of these were founded in Europe and in England. And they basically went out and tried to push the boundaries of science. And in some cases, they succeeded. Uh, that was how all this started. One of the things you find out in the history of the Foundation is that, for example, there was powered flight in the 1850s. And the people who figured out how to do powered flight in the 1850s decided that it was such a technological advancement, what we might today call the singularity, that if this information got out and this was mass produced, it could destabilize entire governments. It could destabilize entire countries, actually. So they began withholding this information. And other groups did the same thing when they found ways of advancing science beyond what was recognized as possible. They did this for the safety of humans everywhere. And then they discovered that there was such a thing as magic, and that even led the Foundation to step in and do other things to protect humanity from themselves. Uh, they didn't go out and actually try killing witches and stuff like that. They went in and worked with them. They wanted to find out how to integrate magic with their super technology. And thus, some things were invented that are even better than they should be because of that. The foundation was really known originally as one of the bigger clubs in England. It was called the Lucifer Club. Lucifer means light bringer, not the evil Lucifer. And that was meant to start doling out these little nuggets of information and technology as they came along. And eventually today, in 2011, when the story takes place, the Lucifer Foundation is known as the Lucy Foundation. But the foundation itself is a big, huge organization all around the world that sort of hides in the shadows and runs everything and tells people what they can and can't have. But they do it nicely. They don't want the world blowing itself up. They want to dole out this technology and make it available to make life easier, but at a pace that's not just going to drive everybody into a technological hellhole. So that's the foundation. One thing you should know about it is that it's a matriarchy. Uh, about 80% of the foundation is run or occupied by women. The uh, same thing goes for the school in Salem. The girls outnumber the boys about four to one. And it's always been that way. It wasn't always as peaceful, but it always was that way. Salem is a school that was founded by five European witches in the 1860s. It was formed on Cape Ann. Massachusetts. Uh, the original town of Salem used to be where Gloucester is today. and It had to leave because it was considered a failed colony. They had all sorts of problems. Gee, I wonder what caused that. Um, probably five witches who didn't want people nearby. As time went along, they had to do more and more and more to keep the people out, keep them thinking that there really wasn't anything in the center of Cape Ann except a big Forest Preserve, which is what you'll see if you look on Google Maps. Wrong. There's something there. You just can't see it. The Foundation bought the school at Salem back in about 1870 or so. And they finally co-edited it. Oh, I'd have to check. I think it was about 20 years later. But... It's, it's a huge place from top to bottom. It's all walled off. It's a couple of, several miles actually, from north to south and a couple of miles across to east to west. There's a lot of space to hide out. It sits behind a set of enormous walls. 
which of course nobody can see. There's a lot of enchantments and technological doodads that make people think they actually went on a hike when they didn't, or make people think they actually carved granite out of that area when they didn't. Uh, it's very easy to fool people that sort of way. The only ones who know that there's something there are the instructors, the staff, and of course the students. My two main characters, the first one is the female character. She, her name is Annie Kirilova. She is Bulgarian. She lives near the resort ski town of Pamperovo. Her father does something which makes money, a lot of money for the family, but I'm not going to tell you what it is because you need to find out within the course of the story. Her mother is a doctor and a pharmacologist, but she prefers to work at home inventing or developing new formulas and mixtures that are tested out among clinics and hospitals throughout Bulgaria, Romania, and Austria. She prefers to stay at home and either work alone or with a person who comes in once in a while. This also allows her to be with Annie, her only child. So she's essentially like, you know, stay-at-home mom, stay-at-home witch, stay-at-home, I make all sorts of things that um, could one day possibly cure cancer. Maybe she has discovered the cure for cancer and they just don't want her to release it yet. As I stated, Annie is an only child. She comes across as cold, unapproachable at times, quiet, but that's just how she wants people to see her. In reality, she's quite vibrant, she's intelligent, she is a natural born leader, she knows how to take charge of a situation. But she figures if people know those things, they'll look for her weaknesses. And she doesn't want them to know her weaknesses. She wants people to guess who she is. She comes across as cold a lot of times, when in reality she's quite romantic. She has a deep passion for romance and love. In fact, when she gives her heart to the right person, that person is probably going to be her one and only that she's going to feel deep down inside for the rest of her life. And in fact, she already has. I find out about that in a second. The other thing about Annie is when she gets mad, she doesn't do a lot of ranting and screaming and yelling. She goes into what could best be described as cold fury. You don't want to be on the receiving end of that. It's not nice. Annie has been called by her parents from time to time selfish. When she wants something, she gets it. She doesn't often want anything. She goes, she doesn't ever go without. But when she wants something specific, she'll keep at you until she gets it. That's just the way she is. She's a tenacious little girl, and she's a good witch. Yes, she is, and she's also a good sorceress. Yes, she is. Although sometimes she doesn't quite believe that. The other member of this duo is Kerry Malaby. Uh, he's originally from America. He was born there. He was born in San Rafael, and for several years lived in the small town north of San Francisco known, this is true, Sleepy Hollow. And his grandparents lived just over a ridge in a town called Lucas Valley, Marionwood. Again, a real place. And Carrie's mother is third generation Irish American. Carrie's father is Welsh. He's never been a naturalized American. In fact, he had a green card when he came to the United States. After he came to the United States, he worked here on a visa. Carrie's mother and father met while they were working at ILM. San Francisco. Carrie's father is a sound effects technician or specialist. Uh, Carrie's mother is a video effects specialist. Sometime before Carrie's eighth birthday, he received a offer to work as a manager in the sound effects department at BBC Wales. And he uprooted the family and moved him over there. Uh, he works full time. Carrie's mom works part time, about three times a week, sometimes. She likes to be home with Carrie because Carrie has not adjusted to the move to Wales very well. In fact, um, it's not set with him at all. 
Carrie's a lot like the opposite of Annie. He's he is introverted. He's quiet, but only because he spends a lot of time being sad and depressed. He's smart, he's clever, he's intuitive. He loves complex older music. He loves to read, he loves his computer. But he suffers from a lot of feelings of inadequacy. He feels as if people don't want him, people don't love him. And it affects him severely. He doesn't feel as if he gets any affection. I once described Carrie as being emotionally unavailable. He just was not in tune with what he was trying to feel. He, he couldn't feel anything. In many ways, he was kind of dead on the inside. So when the people from the foundation came and said, hey, expense paid trip to a private school in America, what did he say? He wanted out right away. Couldn't wait. He needed to be in the proper environment to start to come out, but he's been coming out slowly, and he's had some help. Now, when I say Annie gave her heart to someone, you find out in the course of the story that she knows Carrie. She's known Carrie for a long time. She's developed a certain romantic attachment to Carrie. The problem is, Carrie doesn't seem to know any of this. And it's one of the things that I'm using as the crux of the first novel is this romance that is budding between them. And I'm not talking about holding hands, cuddling, halt, putting each other's heads against each other, tee-hee, look, we're in love. None of that crap. Uh, we're talking like a deep-seated romantic love. These two come across as very much in love when it gets to that point. We're not quite there yet, but it's coming. Trust me. Theirs is going to be a grand romance. They can never get to the point where they know it's a grand romance.